I don't know how it happened, but Mason Sweet talked himself into getting us two water bikes uh, for the cost of one. What is, and, what is what, 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 Eric, how do you do that? And now. <laughs> aye, aye. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Coming to you from the K2 studios in San Diego, California. This sounds great. You sound amazing. I always sound amazing. It's the world famous. Everybody sit off like BFS. Chris and Christine Show. Hey, what's happening? How are you doing today? Thank you so much for being here. And I am Chris. And I'm Christine. And welcome to episode 170 of the Chris and Christine Show. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Fantastic. Aloha. Aloha. Before we get started, we definitely do want to preface this by saying while we are going to be sharing on this episode about um, our wonderful Hawaiian vacation, we don't want that to diminish the struggle of those uh, in on the island of Maui. We did not travel there, uh, but we definitely want to extend all of our condolences and um, send all of our love and support to the people of the island of Maui. Um, Also in the show notes for this episode, we are going to leave links to reputable places that you can donate for the Maui recovery efforts. Um, And we do want to say that at the front end before we get going, because while we are going to be talking in a lighthearted way about our own family vacation on the island of Oahu, we don't want it to take away from the very real tragedy that is happening and unfolding on the island of Maui, correct, That is very correct. It's funny, uh, the town of Lahaina, which is all you hear about in the news, is the town that's been on fire and has uh, burnt down most of it to the ground. Um, I've been to that town. I've been to that village. I've seen it firsthand, and I've been to the island of Maui only one time, but it's very, very tragic and very sad because when you're on an island, there's only so much places you can physically go to without you can't really escape because you're kind of stuck in the roads. I remember there's these two lane little roads. It might've made them bigger, but they're just like country roads, mm-hmm. you know? And if you imagine everybody in town trying to leave town at one time on this one little road and one road goes into the, the path of the fire, the other one kind of goes the other way and you're on an Island. I remember the airport was kind of in the middle of the Island. Right. Not like with Honolulu, it's kind of more towards the coast. So you have to go through the middle of the island through like this, um, they call it the, a valley island because there's hills on mm-hmm. either side of the island. So in the center, it's more like a valley and that is where the airport is and stuff. So you have to go into there to get to, um, you know. To get out. Yeah, to get, basically get out. Or basically, I think Lahaina was also like, they had a lot of docks and a lot of like uh, ports and stuff. I don't think it was as major of a port city like, you know, Honolulu. But they did have a bunch of fishing docks and boats and docks mm-hmm. and things like that. So I could only imagine that those things all, everybody loaded up and got out of there as fast as they could. If they could. Yeah, right. Even if they could, you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it was a jam getting out of there. I don't know. But we are just heartbroken over what's been unfolding. And especially when you look at the the challenges of getting getting relief to the island. And I've been watching videos and people documenting drone footage and the extent of the devastation. It's only comparable. I think the closest thing, different natural disasters, but what we saw emerge in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and the extreme rapid devastation of what occurred there and how hard it was to be able to get services to people. You know, the difference is being in a landlocked community, there's just so many people that are displaced. And so uh, our hearts definitely go out to to the people of the island of Maui and to the entire community of Hawaii. And we just, um, I had this epiphany last night, honey. I was thinking about if Everyone who has ever taken a vacation to Hawaii, ever, would would just donate even $5. Think of the impact that could have. And, you know, when you have a a destination that has become very dependent on tourism 
and they experience something such as this, people automatically, like I've heard, oh, well, I have to cancel this vacation or I had to cancel my wedding. Like, let's Boo-hoo. right. Let's look at the reality. The the Hawaiians, our native Hawaiian indigenous community have lost sacred lands. They're banyan trees, which are very symbolic within their culture that have been growing for thousands of years. The The beautiful countryside is decimated and that has nothing to do with, you know, us losing our vacation or having to replan a wedding. And so let's have some really good perspective right now. And I would encourage everybody that's listening, not out of a shame response, but out of a a collective feeling of, I remember Lilo and Stitch of Ohana. Ohana means family. Like let's show the community of Hawaii that the global community can rally around them. And we'd love for you to donate. Um, We, Chris, the Chris and Christine show, donated from the Hawaii um the Hawaii Foundation I have to get the the exact uh name of the location but we'll definitely leave those in the show notes so that you can go there and donate whether it's $5, $10 or 100, 250 um donate to a reputable organization and there's some that are like ready yeah, to start yes. rebuilding like they have plans to rebuild like 250 family homes over the next 10 weeks. Like it's going to be people. I I really do think that we're going to be able to flood the island with support. But what I hope doesn't happen is that it becomes um, people exploiting the land, if that makes sense. Exploiting. I was going to... Do on the other side of the coin is that every time there's a national major disaster like this where people want to give money, uh, unfortunately, the sad truth is that some of these shady characters do emerge. And that's why it's very important to find out exactly who and what channels to donate your donations through versus going to anybody on Facebook and says, yeah, donate here. And it goes straight to some shady characters pop book and puck book. Pocket book. Yeah, I've been seeing GoFundMes and Venmos pop up and, I, you know, people with their stories of what they've lost and Absolutely. Like if you know them, if you know somebody personally, if you know a family friend, donate to them directly if you are able, but also for the larger recovery efforts. I know that I I was trying to donate through the um, Maui United Way last night. And for some reason, the website wasn't working, but I had the name of a couple of other uh, reputable uh, nonprofits that were leading some of the recovery efforts. And, you know, right now I was just watching a, a video from uh, an acquaintance who's a nurse that lives on the island of Maui who was documenting um, just people bringing boats from other islands to bring flats of water and just offloading them onto the beaches so that people in remote areas can get food and water and that there's hundreds of people that are living in the gyms of different schools and um, churches and, and they just need basic supplies like tents to be able to have temporary living situations. But like, let's do better America. Let's do better by the people of Hawaii and let's see what we can do. And I think we should just put out a challenge. Like if you are listening to this episode and you are able to donate. We would love for you to tag us on social media that you are donating. And um, we would just like to promote you on social media as, you know, making a collective positive impact for the good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And to preface it that we did not go to Maui. We went to Hawaii. We missed this whole fire. By like one week, wasn't it? Uh, no, we missed it. We've been back now for like three and a half uh, weeks already. And so we missed it because it just happened in the past week. So, okay, okay. yeah, so it was almost a month that we missed it by. But for the, the sake of this episode, we are going to be talking about our vacation on the island of Oahu um, and the beauty that we saw there. But before we hop into that, Chris, what's been happening with your week? 
Well, it's, uh, you know, this last week at work was my official full, like, regular week back to work. So it's always difficult coming back from, especially from vacations, because we did two, like, back-to-back trips, travel trips. And I always say, like, you know, I'm kind of tired of looking at the airport. You know, we see so many airplanes at airports. Oh, my gosh. uh, First world problems. I know. You know, (laughs) first world problems, indeed. And uh, although I do love traveling with you, you have been the best traveler ever. Okay, Christine, tell me more. Why do you love traveling with me? I love traveling with Christine because she literally is on it like every which way. If there's a situation that happens or a problem that occurs with changing flights or changing days of flights or maybe even changing seats or something. Christine has it. She's on the phone with the, with the airlines and she's talking to whoever she needs to talk to and she's got us booked. And if there's a problem where we have to stay somewhere, we'll talk about this later in a future episode where we actually have to stay at a hotel randomly because say your flight is delayed a whole day. Christine's got that figured out and all taken care of. And how is my attitude during that whole thing? Don't worry, Chris. We got this. That's what you always tell me. Don't worry, Chris. I got this. We'll figure this out. Don't worry. We got this taken care of. Here I am stressing out that perhaps maybe I uh, forgot to pack something in the hotel or uh, who knows what, you know, or my, my phone's dead on battery juice. I need to get a charge right away. I'm freaking out about that kind of things. And she's like, don't worry about this. I would say that I would classify myself as a reasonably happy traveler. Oh yeah. And how would I classify me as a, <laughs> as a traveler? <laughs> how would you classify you? I'm going to let you classify yourself. Okay. I'm like a lucky, you know, okay. I am like when I travel, despite that make any sense at all, but I am like when you get McDonald's French fries, you know that, and you like you know the bag uh, fries that fall in the bottom of the bag, and you're like, ooh, surprise, but surprise fry, and you get it, and you eat it. That's like me when I travel. I'm like, ooh, it's a surprise, you're going somewhere. But you know, uh, you are not. That is the biggest, fattest, nastiest lie. I didn't say I've no. Heard. You are the fries in the bag. I mean, fries in the actual container because you're prepared. You are like we know we're going there. I'm like the clueless fry that fell out in the bottom of the bag that no one knows is even there. So I'm like, ooh, we're doing traveling. I, I guess so. Let's go. No, a better description would be: I hand Chris the McDonald's bag, and before he even opens it, he starts complaining that the bag isn't the size that he wanted it to be and complaining that he's getting McDonald's versus a steak dinner. No, versus In-N-Out, really. No, it no, it's versus a steak dinner and complain, complain, complain. I don't, we could be, it's not complain, it's commenting. Oh, we could be in first class accommodations going to the most exotic, beautiful location in the world and Chris will find Five negative things for everyone positive. And that is my world, friends. Welcome to the real Chris. It's just comments. That's all I do. (laughs) Or whining, as most people call it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't whine about anything. Um, I don't even drink wine, to tell you the truth. (laughs) Well, you are, I I would say you are an extremely nervous traveler. I think so, because I love to watch all those amazing television shows. You know, the great ones about uh, smugglers at the airport or um, locked Locked up up abroad. Locked up abroad. Yeah, but really. Snakes on a plane. Snakes on a plane. (laughs) Which is funny. The Snakes on the Plane movie was based on a flight from uh, Hawaii to Los Angeles. So we've actually are kind of on that same flight path. Hey, honey, snakes could be on our plane. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, that you ever seen that movie? No, nor will I ever. <laughs> it's basically they want to like, there's like a bad guy that wants to take out another bad guy, but he's being protected by the FBI. He has to uh, face trial in LA against his a former gang or something. Okay, and, you're and giving so, it all away. And so the bad guy's like, we have no, we know a way to get rid of this guy. We'll put snakes on an airplane in the cargo. And that way, <laughs> while the flight's out, mid, out in the ocean, you know, halfway, you know, across the, uh, across the ocean, they can't turn around that. Uh, we'll release all the snakes out and then, you know, the fun ensues as, okay. it, as it were. Okay. So what's funny about this story, you think like, oh, that would never happen. But earlier this week, um, I saw this on Apple News. It came across my phone that there was a plane that was on the runway. All of the cargo had been loaded and they were uh, waiting to take off. And the plane was delayed in departing because a bear that was in the cargo hold that was under sedation to go to, I think it was to Qatar or Kuwait, um, got out of 
its pen and got free in the cargo hold. And so they couldn't take off with the plane because they had a bear on the loose in the cargo. So that is, that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like cocaine beer part two. Yeah, the it was, except it was somebody's, somebody's pet. You know, it's funny. Prince Ali uh, got himself a pet bear and he's shipping it over to his, you know, I seen those videos, those guys, uh, I forget what channel it was. It's, on. Yeah, it's where they have like the private, like the oh, cougars and yeah. stuff at home. This guy's got like a pet tiger. He's like scratching his, you know, his neck and stuff and wrestling with him in the bathtub. Like, hey, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. you your face off. Well, that's exactly what this situation was. So, you know, Chris is a nervous traveler. So the story, our whole uh, Hawaiian vacation recap is going to kick off before we even got onto the plane. So the day before we travel, we have this little routine that we've started with all of our kids where we have a family meeting before we go. And uh, the kids love this. I don't know what it is, but I type up an itinerary for our trip. I'm looking at it right here. Right. I type up an itinerary with the things that we know for certain that we're going to do each day. And we walk through what to expect every day in detail, all the way down to what time are we waking up and how are we going to the airport. And the kids love, for some reason, every tiny individual detail and they ask questions about every day. And so we kicked off our preparation with our family meeting. And by the time we got to the family meeting, the rule always is before we do family meeting and we go over the itinerary, everyone has to be completely packed with their bags downstairs. This is the night before we leave. And that is our reward for being able to go over the itinerary. When it comes to packing bags, normally when I travel, I'm like such a lazy guy that I like to travel and pack the same day just because I'm like, well, I don't know what I want to wear. I don't want to pack and, and that sort of thing. But you convinced me, you have to, Chris, you have to pack everything and then just uh, set aside an outfit you're going to travel with. So I'd have an outfit set aside that I would have ready to go. So when I wake up and shower and all that great stuff, I just throw it on into the airport we go. So that is what happened. We were leaving. We were flying out on a Sunday and Chris had worked Friday. So the kids and I were fully packed. So all four of us were fully packed with our suitcases and carry-ons downstairs already by Saturday. And Chris wakes up and everybody in the family knows that we don't get to move on to any other part of the preparation to leave for vacation until Senor Christopher gets his stuff together literally and packs his bag. And so And I did on Saturday. I packed everything. So let's talk about that on that Saturday. Uh, oh yeah? Yeah. How did you approach your packing? Uh I was like, I can't make this whole everything fit in this bag here. I don't know how to pack nothing. I oh by the way, I am horrible at folding shirts. I don't know why some people are like gifted. I guess if you work at any of the Department stores, which you, I did in, well, in college, which are department stores. You must teach this in department school 101. I don't know. It's how to fold the shirt properly because I can't do it. So, Christine helped me fold all these shirts. I know, I know, make fun of me now. I can't, okay. fold, I can't fold shirts, but it's one thing. No, I, but you, you hang them up. That's why, because you've not had to ever fold them because everything gets hung up in the closet. That's why we invented hangers and yeah. closets for us, hang stuff up. Duh. So, I packed all my stuff up and I'm Frantically trying to make sure in my mental head checklist of like chargers, what computers, what tablets, what gear, what gadgets, all these different things. And I went on Amazon a few days before and I ordered everybody brand new charger bricks and brand new charger cords for every kid and every member of the family. So we all got our own chargers for this trip. None of them, nobody's stealing chargers or say, I don't have my charger and get to mm -hmm. buy one at the gift shop for 10 times the price. Right. But uh, I got everything packed ready to go. That was Saturday because I knew on Sunday we did have a very extremely early morning to get to the airport. Right. And so we had plans on Saturday. I think we overplanned on that day where we knew we were going to have to get you packed and we were going to have to finish wrapping up everything around the house. We needed to um, get all of the sheets changed over to fresh sheets and do laundry because uh, we were having your mom come over to puppy sit for us. And we... You had promised the kids that we were going to go to a movie that day. And I just kept saying, like, I don't think it's going to fit in. And you were like, 
so hell bent on us going to the movies. And I just kept saying like, I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't think it's going to happen. And it created a lot of stress before the vacation so that that day just felt like a ticking time bomb. And I think the that tends to happen for families that are getting ready to v- go on vacation is you know, the kids are super excited, bouncing off the walls. They can't wait. The parents are frantically trying to get everything together. And then something happens that just sets everything off. And for us, it was that Jacob and Mason forgot their spending money at their mom's house and come to find out their wallets were locked in a safe at their mom's house and she lost the ability to be able to get the safe open. So just imagine the dynamic. What's the point of the safe then if you can't open it? (laughs) It's like, just imagine the chaos that ensues when the kids had been saving up their spending money. It was locked away in a safe place. And now we find out the night before we're leaving that these hundreds of dollars that they'd been stuffing away, they had no access to. They were going to have to go on vacation with no spending money. And it was literally like World War Three, the end of times that had just come down on our household. So me being the hero that I am, I have to go and save the day, you know, and run to the bank, and run to the ATM, Apple pay me this, Apple pay me that, move money around. This is all like literally the day before we have to fly The at- night before. Like this is, we're talking like 6 p.m. Right. Where we have a flight, it's like at 5 in the morning or whatever time it was. Right. So... Literally, we're trying to get home so we can get some sleep because we have to get ready for the early flight in the morning. But like I said, the night before, run around, get cash for the kids and all that wonderful stuff. So we had to do all that and then run back here. So that's where our my idea of going to a movie that night just fizzled away because I knew that wasn't happening. Once I knew we had to run around and do extracurricular crap, then I knew it wasn't going to happen. Right. So we started off vacation with not being able to go to the movies, but we got everything else that And then I finally got everybody calmed down. We got, I think we door dashed dinner that night or something. We just got something simple and got everybody to bed because we knew we needed to leave the house at 5.15 a.m. to be able to get to the airport in time and get through security in time to get on our plane and leave. That is incredibly early for those who may not know. 5 a.m. is when you had to leave the house, you said? 5.15, yeah. Which means we probably had to wake up closer to 4, 4 a.m. wake right. up time. And that's exactly what we did. And you have a very particular routine in the morning where you need to get your coffee. And I think it's like you need those steps to be able to fully wake up. And I don't think that our audience knows that like how much you hate change. <laughs> well, I think maybe you get older, you get used to your custom routines and things like that. And I I am not one to wake up out of bed and go straight to work and like get up and go. I know people have, and I know when I worked on the day shift side, I kind of had to learn that, although I was still a slow learner when it came <laughs> to that kind of thing. <laughs> because I like to wake up and, you know, mosey around for a while, get coffee and then hang out for a while. And then about three hours later, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll start, you know, working on my day. Right. But I'm kind of lazy. Maybe I wonder if it's an old man thing. When you get older, you just want to get your coffee and sit and watch the you know, morning news and kind of just hang out, read the paper, just chill for a while before you physically do anything. That's got to be what it is. Maybe. But we ended up getting everybody up. The boys were really great. They got up. They got ready. All of our stuff was all in one location. And so we just, we all rolled it out, got the Explorer loaded up. And we got to the airport and uh, we went up and got our bags checked. And the nice thing is I have TSA pre-check. And so I take the little ones with me through the TSA pre-check because they have that on their tickets. But this is now Zeke is 18 and you don't have TSA pre-check. So they split I'm not allowed us. to have TSA pre-check, I think. So they told me. Why? I don't know. I made that up. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, you just haven't gone through all of the paperwork, but... Pay the dinero is what right. it really is. And so we got separated. Um, but to make things easier, I took all the carry-ons with me so that we didn't have to take all of the laptops and everything out. And you and Zeke went through the other side and the other side. And there was this 
huge security line that we all had to navigate through. And we didn't expect that that early in the morning. No, not really. Well, actually, you know what? I mean, what time is the very first flight of the day? You know, is it like six? I think it's like right around then, six, six thirty. Yeah. yeah, it's a Sunday. Is Sunday a busy airplane travel day? I don't know. I don't know, but it was like peak summer travel season. So I think that there was a lot more people. And we flew on Hawaiian Airlines. Shout out to Hawaiian Airlines. They do fly regularly out of San Diego. Uh, Non-stop flights directly to Oahu. That is the best way because people say, well, how else would it be? It wouldn't be a non-stop flight to Hawaii. It's got to be non-stop. I said, well, sometimes what we'll do is we'll fly to Phoenix and then fly to Hawaii. Or San Francisco, which is a hub. Yes. Yes. I actually flown into San Francisco from Hawaii one time. And so, yeah, I I know that. Or even LAX. Mm -hmm. LAX is a big one, too, where they'll take you to LA, then up to Hawaii. But thank God that we fly direct out of San Diego straight over there. Right. It's about a five and a half hour flight, I believe, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, well, it was. I think it was like four hours and 50 minutes on the way there and then five and a half on the way back for whatever reason. But we got through security and nobody had had anything to eat. And so I grabbed us all breakfast. And what's so funny is you had to go stop for a restroom break and I got the boys and I took them over to this restaurant And I was thinking, okay, well, I've got a little bit of time while Chris makes this little pit stop. I'm going to take the boys. We're going to order breakfast. And then by the time the breakfast is cooked, we'll go back to the gate. Everybody will eat. And then Chris will be out of the restroom. Well, then I get this panicked text and it's like 911, 911, 911. Who sent you that message? You. I did? Yes. For what? You said you couldn't find me. Well, uh, you listen. Travel nervous Chris traveling at the airport, <laughs> lost and trying to figure out what gate we're at and what what the where's Christine at. Like, I, okay, are you talking about after we got the food and when I went back over to where the gate was at and you guys were gone? Well, this was when I was getting the food. You went, you left the restroom to go back to the gate, and you thought that we'd boarded the plane without you. I thought that because I'm like, wait a second, where is everybody? Every everybody was gone, and I'm at the gate, and that I've checked my ticket. This is the right gate, but. I don't think they're letting anybody on, but maybe they did. I don't know. And so I just told him, come on down. We're just at the restaurant. We're getting breakfast. And so uh, you came and sat with us for the five minutes until the breakfast was ready and got everybody fed. And then it came time to board. And we had secured upgraded seats for all of us, which was a real treat. We got to sit in the... Hawaii Comfort Plus section, which is right behind first class. And it comes with like three to five extra inches of leg room. And you need them and, too. Trust yeah. Me. yeah. And the the seats are a little bit cushier and the headrest is a little bit cushier. And it folds back a little more too. Yeah. It leans back further. And it was definitely a really luxurious experience for such a long flight. And if you ever flown Hawaiian Airlines before, when you get in there, uh, they have these little TVs like most airlines do right behind the headrest. And as you get onto the airplane from Hawaiian Airlines, they're playing all kinds of Hawaii like videos. In fact, their actual like safety video for takeoff, it's all Hawaiian themed with people around the Hawaiian Islands demonstrating Oh, your head met your uh, seatbelt goes like this. In case of oxygen gets depleted, the head, the thing comes down like this. You put the mask on your face like this. It's all people who live and work in around Hawaii and showing video. I think it's a really cool experience because it makes you want to watch the video because right. one, you are going to Hawaii. You're going to the islands. You get excited about going to Hawaii and you get all these like video clips of the islands and, and stuff like that. I think it's great. And I, this is our second time flying with Hawaiian Airlines. I really love the flight crew on the Hawaiian Airlines planes because a lot of the individuals that work for Hawaiian Airlines live on the Hawaiian Islands. And so you get this different type of hospitality and they call it the spirit of aloha. And they are very proud of that with Hawaiian Airlines and So one of the things that they do is, you know, for the adults, they offer you this, um, it's like a rum punch that it's like a tropical. It's like a Mai Tai, but not. right? Right. It's a lot milder, but it's like a little tropical rum punch. And then you get, of course, food and beverages. Um, they give you like a hot meal and, um, they're not always great because it's airplane food, but. It's like a new top pocket kind of thing. Kind of. Yeah. But. You get a fun experience and then 
you know, they have their snack cart and things like that where you can purchase items. And, you know, what with where we were sitting, we were really close to the um the entry to the plane and the restroom area. So we could get up, stretch our legs, we could walk around just a little bit and Um, It was very cold on the plane, but other than that, it was a really lovely flight. I loved it. And they have that interactive screen I was telling you about where you you can plug your headphones into it and you can watch all kinds of good movies, um, watch the flight tracker. And then the flight tracker, I I don't know what it is about that thing, but I got addicted to it on all the flights (laughs) you've done. Because when I used to fly when I was younger, we never had that thing. It was like, well, where are we on the flight? You just had to look at the time and figure we're halfway or midway or whatever. But with that flight tracker, it tells you in real time how fast you're going, the altitude, where you are in the world, where you are on the map. It's a quite fun, fun little toy. I, I yeah, love it. It is it is really fun. When I fly uh, towards like Europe and things like that, it's really cool because you'll be able to see like what area of Canada are you flying over when you fly over Iceland or Greenland and then the different countries and that's really awesome to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're flying over that right now. It's pretty cool. Hey, speaking of flying, I did notice that when we were flying Hawaiian Airlines to Hawaii, they had the flight set at around 40,000 feet, which I think is on the upper tier of how high you know, commercial airlines usually fly at. I know they say they might go a little higher, but 40, I believe when you get to 40, you actually do it for, um, there's less oxygen, less wind resistance, less mm. tur- tur- turbulence. Maybe you can go a little faster. I maybe. don't know. Maybe and they got in a jet stream or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. But I just find that very interesting how high up we were. Well, it was a great flight on the way over. And once we landed, we had our... I had arranged to have a flower lay greeting. And so... Oh, you got to do that. Hawaii. Yeah. You know, it used to be they give you that for free. It was a free thing you got as you walk off the plane. But that was like back in the 50s or 60s. But now, you can, you know, it's like everything. You got to pay for it. Yes. Right. But it wasn't that expensive. And so the guy came and he gave us each our flower lay while we were waiting for our luggage. And people were looking like, oh, where'd you get that from? And it was pretty cool. Um, And then, you know, after that, we went and we got our rental car and then we headed over to the resort. What time of day was it when we landed, you think? We landed at like 1130. But by the time, time. Yeah. But by the time that we got to the resort, it was like, 1 30 ish but we were grateful because our room was actually ready right when we got there and checked in so we were able to immediately go up to our uh, i wouldn't call it a condo because we stayed at the grand vacation club for hilton grand vacations so shout out to hilton for a great stay uh, not sponsored, but definitely we're open to it. We're so open you to can the sponsor idea, us the in the idea, future. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we still did the, stayed at the Hilton Grand Vacation Club. And it was a deal that I'd been searching around. I, I love planning vacations and finding the best deals. And I found us this, this setup that it was a two-bedroom, two-bathroom luxury suite with an ocean view and we got a really good deal on it and it had the one patio which actually was kind of scary to think about because you go to this little patio area which isn't very big it's big enough for like a couple chairs and like a coffee table and a couple things but we're, we were on the 35th 32nd 32nd floor and straight down where there was a pool right below us so you can drop something off the balcony and you go right into the swimming pool which wasn't very big or deep for that matter. Right. It was like an infinity pool. Right. And then overlooking straight across was the ocean. And we kind of looked towards the uh, uh, east, which was towards um, the mountain of um, Diamond, Diamond Head. Diamond Head. Yeah. Was it east or is that south? No, because you think about it, United States at that point, the mainland is east. I'm assuming it's east. It's east, right? I don't know. Well, whatever. I'm going to trust you on that one. Yeah. Well, so we go up to the elevator which is pretty cool. So you this at this location, there's no buttons inside of the elevator where you can just like choose which floor and to go totally to. that totally threw me off. I didn't know how to use the machine. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like an iPad at in the lobby area or at every floor. And you pop in your room number. Or your and then, floor. Yeah, your floor. And then it tells you which elevator you're going to go on and it pre-programs it. So... The elevators were labeled A, B, C, and D. 
So when anytime we would get ready to go up or down, we would approach this little iPad looking thing, put in number 32, and then it would tell us elevator A or elevator D. And when that elevator would open and you would step inside, it would have a list right inside of the door of what floors it was going to be stopped. Like a little digital right. list or whatever. So, But the funny thing is it physically inside the elevator, there is no buttons. Right. So, so you're like, what floor? Did I, you know, that's the thing that kind of threw me off at first. I didn't know how to find the room, how to find <laughs> where we're at and all that great stuff. But one thing I was going to tell you about the flight over from San Diego or anywhere from the West Coast over to Hawaii, one of the nice things is, is that because they are three-hour time difference behind us, is that when you fly over to Hawaii from San Diego, you feel like the flight feels like nothing because when you land, you're like, I got all this day still. It's right. great. It's great. Going the other way, it's just the opposite. You feel like you lose the entire day when totally. you, f- you fly over. But flying flying from the from the San Diego to Hawaii is great. I always love flying over. Yeah, it was really awesome. So we get onto the elevator and we get up to our room. Chris was still parking the car, but the boys and I walked into the room And we were blown away. Like I knew that we had a decent amount of space with the room that we reserved, but it was gorgeous in there. It was like another, it was like literally like an apartment. Like that's the way I describe Mm -hmm. it. It's like a basic apartment or not basic, but a nice apartment, an apartment complex with a living room area and a kitchen area. And then it had a hallway with like one bedroom, had two beds in it and then another bedroom at the end. And then it had a master bedroom with a master bathroom and shower Mm -hmm. and tub. And then it had a regular shower and tub. Uh, no, I think it was just a shower, but it was it was a shower. Yeah, but it was another bathroom. And then the kicker was it had its own laundry room or actually laundry machine, a stackable washer and dryer right down the hallway. Just mm-hmm. Open the door and it was right there. So that was great. It also had a little pantry in the kitchen where like pantry cabinet had a full size fridge, it had a range and an oven. Like it literally had everything that we needed. But I did notice a sink in the kitchen was it, it was tiny. <laughs> it was like literally like the size of like I almost say like a motorhome or travel trailer right. size sink. It was just kind of weird. But but uh, they did have a dishwasher, even though it was kind of like a scaled down size. Uh we were able to be super comfortable there. And the master was nice and big. And then the one bedroom that the that Zeke and Jacob ended up sharing had two double beds in each one or two queens. And then there was a full sofa sleeper in the living room for Mason. And it was like so much great space for us to be able to spread out that immediately when I saw it, it just felt like relaxation because I didn't feel like everybody was just going to be like sitting on top of each other the entire time. Well, I, I remember there's some vacations that I went on. When I used to grow up younger, a whole family would cram into one room and have like the two queens and we all cram into that one room, you know, and, right. and try to like, and then one person be sleeping on either the floor or maybe the order the uh, the pull out bed or whatever goofy mm-hmm. thing. I don't know if they still do that or not, but um, like that kind of stuff. And and to be sp- so like able to have your own space, it literally felt like staying in a house. It did. And so once we got in and we got our bags there, everybody unpacked quickly. And the first thing that the boys wanted to do is they wanted to go down to the pool and to the beach. And Chris and I wanted to get some food. And this is the first time that we've been on vacation where it felt like we could give the boys a little bit of independence now that Zeke's 18, Jacob's 13, and Mason, you know, he's 11, but he's swimming independently and he's a pretty strong swimmer now. And so we felt like, okay, well, we can give them a little bit of flexibility. They could stay in the lagoon for the beach because there was no real big waves and we can let them play right there. And we could see them from where we were at at the restaurant. Cause it was just a few steps away. And that first day we just had so much fun, just relaxing, going to the pool. The kids went out and they swam and they took the GoPro and they were filming all kinds of stuff. And it was just a really nice, relaxing trip. It was that first day settling. I remember, I think I did jump in the pool too with the kids for a little bit. You, you know? did. And just to check it out, say I was in the pool, which probably, I think it was the only time I was actually in the swimming pool right. the entire vacation because you're next to a big ocean, a big mm-hmm. lagoon, a big, like everything is right there. The beach, the water, and the water inside the actual ocean of Hawaii, the ocean, the ocean next to Hawaii, the water temperature is pretty warm. It's not super, 
super cold. I know the pool is pretty good too, but uh, it was great. We get in there, and very exciting. We our very first day. Go to the restaurant. We all order food. We all have snacks. And I think we had, I think I had a pina colada too, if I remember correctly. We I, had to. Yeah, it's, it's something you have to do. When you go <laughs> that or a Mai Tai or something like that. You right. just have to have that. And there was a live musician uh, playing a band right next to us. Oh, yeah. It was a, a ukulele and guitar player. And they were singing too. And it was just like the perfect ambiance. And, you know, when we got there, as we were walking down to the restaurant, we were getting ready to walk down to the water we walked by the little chapel where we were supposed to get married. That's right, yeah. And we were able to show that to the boys. And that was a really special moment. And I think that that whole first day for me was like, I was pretty emotional and I didn't realize I was going to be because while I love our wedding and I thought our wedding day was perfect and beautiful, it was still going back to revisit what we had hoped we would have for our wedding day and seeing it again and still like those feelings of a little bit of loss over what we didn't get to have. But then the whole rest of the trip, it was just reinforced that like it was so much better not having our wedding there because then we were really able to enjoy this trip with our boys without the pressure of all of the wedding festivities. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah, I can only imagine like you're saying, like you stressed out about a wedding. I mean, you were in the wedding business, you know, how stressful that can be. Right. And you're not thinking about the the fun stuff. You're thinking about all the, all the knickknacks and all the details and all that stuff. So, yeah, I totally get that. And um, speaking of that, I did show you. Yeah, we showed the kids the place we were working at married. I did you know, get pictures and video of it. And, and it just looks great. You know, I mean, it'd be a great place to do it. But uh, I think being there with the kids and being more freer to do things that are more fun stuff, it, it's more fun. Because I don't, I don't know if the kids would have really enjoyed the wedding as much as they would have enjoyed this trip. Right. I agree. And so that night, after those little fun things that we did, you and I were brainstorming as because we <laughs> we had sticker shock after the first meal. So oh, we you didn't mean have... like a price tag for how much the actual restaurant right. charge? Well, that restaurant is right on the beach. They are, I forget what they're called, but they have live music like they did and drinks and. It's literally like, I wouldn't call it bar food or, or Denny's. What kind of food do you call it? It's nothing gourmet, but it's like... Well, we had small bites because you and I just wanted something The price to tag eat. did not reflect small bites. Right. But like I ordered these Kahlua pork nachos and you got... It was so funny. You ordered the coconut shrimp and I asked them because it was from the appetizer menu. Like, does it come with fries or anything? And they said, no, it was just the shrimp. And it was like... $23 and then it came out and it was six shrimp. Yeah, it was like your normal size of shrimp, like six of them. For like $23. <laughs> and so then, you know, here we had our little meal and our couple of drinks, our drink each. And so we were getting ready to pay. And then the kids show up at the entrance to the restaurant. And they're hungry because they they're nothing, starving. Because they've been playing in the water for the last hour and a half, just it, like jumping off the thing and running around the water. So they got they got a workout. So they're hungry now, you know, and they're yeah. like, I'm starving. So they come in and they pull up chairs and we end up ordering food for them and drinks for them. And then we looked at the sticker price of, you know, at the end the bill was like, I don't know, like $180. Uh, no, honey, try like 270 Was it? Yes. I didn't think it was that much. Well, I, I paid for it, so you're welcome. Okay. So don't you worry <laughs> yeah. a thing, you know? So then after that, you and I, we went back to the hotel. We were like, okay, let's come up with a game plan because, of course, that was our first meal, but we're not going to splurge and eat big like that Can every night. That every single meal being $250? Yeah, so expensive. Gosh, that's like a price of a plane ticket when you're done with it flying right. over there. <laughs> So we brainstormed and then I told you that Instacart delivers to the resort and your mind was blown with that. I'm like, holy crap. Can, can, do they have like, then I thought like, okay, I know they don't have the regular stores we have here, but maybe they have a Costco too, because Costco, I don't think Costco is in Hawaii. I know that for a fact, but I don't know if they're the same stuff because sometimes, you know, different stores, different locations, right. but fortunately they did. They did. And so I ordered two Instacart deliveries, one from the Safeway grocery store and one from Costco and made the decision to stock up on a couple of prepared meals so that we could eat in a few nights and relieve that stress. But then things like bottled water, coffee, creamer, 
the things that add up so quickly on vacation and and things that we don't want to go out or wait to have in the morning. Like I wanted more than anything to just, especially because we had a coffee maker, to have coffee in our room, take our coffee mugs out onto the lanai, look at the ocean, have like a slow start to the morning, let the kids wake up slowly. And so we planned out a few meals. And then surprisingly, this was what blew me away. When we ordered from Costco, the prices were exactly the same as they are here. So I got like the big rotisserie chicken and it was like $5.60. I got the taco tray that we like to get with the street tacos that has like the meat, the cheese, the cabbage, the tortillas, the limes, everything. And it was like $16.80. And so we were intentional about ordering some of those things. And then from the grocery store, we got things like eggs, bacon. Uh, We got a case of soda so that we weren't buying sodas for the kids from the vendors around every little bit. And we realized like we could just pack a cooler bag, which I did put one in the suitcase with us. We just pack a cooler bag and take that with us whenever we were going to go out on a beach adventure or whatever. Yeah. It was very, very good thinking that they actually did deliver. Because like also too, is if we we didn't have that Instacart, we'd have to go drive around and find the store. Right. And then figure out, you know, like you physically have to leave what, what you're doing. And then you have to go into the store and do the whole shopping cart thing and then bring it over here. Thank God for that instant cart delivery thing, service because all you do is click on your phone, click, 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 and then you waited a couple, like an hour or so later, and they showed up, actually showed up downstairs. The boys and I had to go downstairs in the elevator, load up with the uh, bags and stuff, and bring it all back up to the room, which is like no big deal. Right. Which is, that's the worst of it all. It's nothing, <laughs> you know? And so, so we spent like $250 on groceries for the week, but we ended up getting ourselves like, four or five prepared meals. We had everything we needed for breakfast for the whole week. So we never ate breakfast out a single day. We had everything we needed for our coffee in the mornings. And then we got a few snacks for the kids, which we would pack with us whenever we went to the beach. Um, And then the other thing that we did before we left is I went to the Dollar Tree and I got different, like a couple of, I found out what each person's favorite snack food was. And I actually found it all at Dollar Tree and I brought it home. And after we did our itinerary review, every got, everybody got to pick four or five snack items from the snack pile to put in their carry-on. And they kept that with them for the week. So you know, whether it's trail mix or beef jerky or Rice Krispie treats or whatever, everybody had their go-to snack item. And that's a way that we saved a lot of money on being able to eat what we wanted for the week while still staying in budget. That's right. Good thinking on you, babe. Good yeah, thinking. thanks. So after that first day of just getting there and getting settled and figuring out the food situation, I told you that on this trip specifically, I wanted downtime at the resort to just be able to enjoy ourselves. And so that first full day after we got after we flew in, we had a day of relaxation at the resort. And that night we had a luau that we went to. So on that relaxation day, we ended up going down. Um, The resort is right on the water. There's a private beach there. And we rented um, these chaise lounge chairs and umbrella. And we would packed all of our snorkeling gear to take with us to save costs. And the boys went out and they just started snorkeling in the lagoon to see what they could find. Oh, we found a lot of stuff because there's a lot of rock and coral and all kind of, it's not all sand like we have here, but there's a lot of rocky coral stuff and lots of fish to see and all kinds of neat stuff. And the boys and I had a blast just snorkeling right outside the resort there. It was great. Very calm waters, very clear waters for the most part, you know, and inside the water to our surprise we saw sea turtles. I know. And you were not that far from the shore. And they just like, I was out in the water a little ways away from you all. And then all of a sudden you all start like motioning to me like turtles, turtles, turtles. And I was like, what? And then I see out of nowhere, this beautiful sea turtle just pop its head up, get a little bit of air and go down and dive again. And so 
our boys, like we didn't even have to leave the property and this pair of sea turtles that are pretty big in size had just like floated right in front of them. So it was a good teaching time for us to remind our boys about keeping a safe distance. We also, as we were snorkeling, were teaching them about you know, not putting your feet down and touching the reef or the coral because it could disrupt it. Uh, but then we were using the GoPro video to be able to capture a lot of the images too, right, Chris? Absolutely. See, I don't travel anywhere without my phone, my key, well, my phone and my GoPro cameras. Absolutely. And so um, we definitely have all of that video already up on the website, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but we finished up the day, went upstairs, got everybody cleaned up, and then we took a drive. It was about an hour or 45 minutes from the resort to uh, Chief's Hawaiian Luau, which you and I had visited before, but we loved it and we wanted to take our boys to an actual luau. And I wasn't sure how they would react to going to the luau thing because it's like, the luau is part show, part dinner, and the dinner is like a buffet. So you have to go through a line, pick out what you want, put it on your plate, bring it back to your table. It's like a wedding buffet, I guess, but, mm -hmm. but much bigger. Like, like, Can you imagine if that was a wedding venue yeah. size of reception you had to handle? That would be like nuts, you know? So they had the stage where all these luau people were giving the presentations and doing the dancing and, and all that stuff. And one of the best things of that entire luau is they had this part where all the kids... We're going up on stage to participate in the uh, Hawaiian dance. And we said, Mason, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. Come on. I don't know. I said, come on, Mason. Let's go. He said, okay, you guys it. were pressuring him so much. <laughs> and he finally goes up on stage. He runs all the way up the stage. We're sitting in the back. So he said, runs all the way up on stage. He was the glass kid on the stage. He goes up on the very end and he shakes his little butt and tail butt. And he kind of just like does the Hawaiian dance. It was so funny. We're all cheering him on. Everyone's cheered his name. It was He, he must have had so much fun doing it. And he was cracking me up, but the boys got to have a lot of different types of Hawaiian cuisine. And when we got to see uh, various styles of Polynesian dancers, uh, Ezekiel loves the haka, which comes from New Zealand. And so he got to see that performed in real life. And he's seen it on TV and YouTube and things like that before. Uh, but the boys were just so fascinated with the whole show. and. Chiefs Hawaiian Luau does a really great job. I really love it. Yeah, they're pretty massive. They get all organized. And it's the funny thing is you think of Luau, you think of like being on the beach. I always imagine that the, the Hawaiian Luau's were like right there on the sand. That's where they do it. But this one's inland. It's actually at a water park right. that they obviously it's closed for this event. But during the day, it's a water park, I guess. But they must have like a cleared out area where they do the whole luau thing in a stage and the whole thing kind of set up and they got it all figured out. Absolutely. And so after that, we drove back and got a little bit of rest because we were getting excited for the very next day, which was when we were going to Waimea Valley and we were doing what was on my list of things that I had wanted to do the last trip and didn't get to, which is go and swim in the pool of a waterfall. Actually, I thought you wanted to jump off the waterfall. I wanted to go swim in the pool below the waterfall. The kids wanted to jump in. I would have jumped with them, but it wasn't allowed where we went. Right. So it, the, what she's talking about is a Waimea Falls. Now, this waterfall is actually part of, is it part of a, um, is it part of like a um, preserve? Yeah, or? it's like a nature preserve kind of slash botanical gardens. And so it's very green, very lush, looks like a rainforest. And so you have the choice when you go there, you can hike back to the falls, which is about a 30 minute hike. Uh, or you can pay for the shuttle, which is by a golf cart. And so I wanted to preserve my energy. And so yeah. we hopped onto the golf cart, which was great though, because they take you along this road where you're able to see all of this native foliage and you see the beautiful ginger lily flowers, birds of paradise. And um, yeah. Lots just, of green. I did notice that the actual like canopy of the tree, the trees branch up. Like if you notice a, a, a typical like pine tree, they go shoot up straight and their needles kind of hang down. And there's not a lot of like, I mean, if they get close together to get some shade, but these, these trees like go up and they kind of, their leaves like branch out like a big giant bush, but in the, in the 
canopy part. They kind of give you a lot of shade. And it had these like vines where I noticed these vines almost made like a fence along some of the other trees <laughs> of this vine. Like, I guess they all right. kind of mush together like a net, almost like a vine net where they all kind of get together. And I noticed the big tall vines that you see like in the Indiana Jones movies right. where they swing across and things like that. But once we get all the way up to the waterfall, it is completely packed with people and everybody's there. And everybody is wanting to go in the waterfall or take pictures with the waterfall. And they have this whole like bleacher section where you can put your bags and sit down and look at it and things like that. Now, these waterfalls have been in a lot of television and movie production. So you might recognize these waterfalls if you ever see like the show Lost. It was in it many episodes. And I'm sure a lot of other movies that right. these waterfalls were in production because they're they're pretty common. And they're, and they're like the thing, like almost like a staple. When you see like, oh, I know those, you know. Right. And so the nice thing about it is that they keep it very safe. So nobody's allowed to jump because there's rocks close under the surface. Or go near the rocks, really. Uh, right. Yeah. There was some unstable rock areas where they keep you away from the rock wall. But everybody wears life jackets when you go in. And they provide them right there. Right. But I would recommend and things that I would have done differently, which you were totally fine with, but I wasn't, is wear water shoes because... You are stepping over rocks to get down to the water. I have very sensitive feet and it was really hard for me to like step on these kind of sharp and slippery rocks. Whereas you had, you had your hiking water shoes, but I think that even those simple, like they're kind of like mesh on the top and like black on the bottom, like the water shoes that kids normally wear, like in the rivers and things like that. Yeah. Something those like would that. have been totally yeah, fine. There wasn't. That I could see. There wasn't any like easy like steps or path directly no. into the water. So you're kind of going over all this like it's broken big chunks of rock. It's like you know, getting into a creek or a stream, how it's not an easy path. Usually right. it's like rocks and crap you got to get into. But once you get in there, see, everybody has a life vest on because it's like 30 feet deep. You can't touch the bottom right. when you're swimming around this thing. So, so thank God everybody had their life vest on because it kept you afloat where you kind of enjoy being in the pool with everybody else. Right. And, and they did have lifeguards yeah. there that were watching. And I think they're just yelling at people for not putting their <laughs> life vest on is what they're really doing. Because like I said, there's no real easy path to get in there. So if they had to get in there to get somebody out, they had to like somehow jump over the rocks, like, right. I guess, to get in there. Definitely. So um, the waterfall was really fun. Now, we tried to get some good family photos together because I had this genius idea that we could do you know, use the GoPro and take a photo for a family Christmas picture. But first of all, the kids weren't having it. And second of all, when we tried to pose ourselves right up by the waterfall, there wasn't enough ledge space for all of us to stand or sit. And then there was this kind of current that was like pushing us away from the waterfall. Well, I guess the waterfall hits the, hits the water that impact kind of like spreads out the impact. Right. So it kind of pushes the water away from the impact where the water lands. So that could be what it is. Yeah. So we finished up our time there, had lunch there at the cafe at Waimea Valley, Waimea Falls, and then decided for the rest of the afternoon. Oh, before you say that, don't oh. forget, somebody had a hike all the way down the hill by themselves. Oh, boo-hoo. Okay, tell your story. So while we're waiting for the shuttle to pick everybody up, because everyone's done, they want to get the shuttle right back. Great. The shuttle only holds like X amount of seats, right? right? And so it just so happens... Well, we had one too many people that could ride on the shuttle. And uh, so I took one for the team. But and you said I, you wanted to. And I said, you know what, guys? You guys ride back and I will walk and hike all the way down this mountain by myself in my water wah, shoes. Wah, wah. All the way down. Carry, oh, by the way, I'll carry, I'll, I'll carry your luggage too. Don't worry about it. I'll, you I'll, didn't I'll, even. I'll carry my stuff and I'll walk. Your little <laughs> tiny like little sideways backpack that's smaller than the size of a woman's purse. Well, anyways, I had to carry that and my towel all the way down the hill. But while I did do that, I get a chance to look at all the looky loo stuff they had, like the little village set up and the different plants and trees and the, these cool looking bananas I saw were pretty neat. I took a picture of that. All kinds of neat things you guys missed out when you rode in the on the golf cart. Yes, we did. But we ended up stopping and having lunch at the cafe and uh, that was great. Prices were actually pretty reasonable. And then after we left the um, Waimea Valley or Waimea Falls Park, 
we decided to go on the hunt for a beach that we can go and hang out at for a couple of hours. And so we found a beach that it has a different Hawaiian name, but it's commonly referred to as Three Tables Beach. No way. And it's because it has these three rock formations that are kind of at the entrance to this like protected, I wouldn't call it a lagoon because there was some decent little waves that were coming through there, but it's North Shore. So it gets more of the wind. Uh, but I would have to say that snorkeling there was some of the most beautiful snorkeling that I've ever seen. There were schools of vibrant fish. We didn't see any turtles there, but crabs and coral and it right. was really gorgeous. There was a lot more different shapes of coral and mm-hmm. a lot of different pockets of sand, coral. They had like those arch holes, I think too. Was it there? We saw some of the arches. Yeah, they call them lava tubes. Oh, is that what they are? Mm-hmm. Anyways, so we saw a lot of that kind of stuff too and at that beach there, which on the North Shore, which also I think the White Man Falls is on the North Shore side of the island too. Right. So, and there is a Waimea Falls or Waimea Beach that's right across from where the falls are, but it is one of the most popular surfing spots and there was very little parking. So we bypassed that and we went to the three tables. That's right. Yeah. So we had so much fun over there. I parked almost like right in front. And I think about it. Like yeah. A parking spot. Although those roads are very, very busy. There's always a lot of traffic on them. So when you nose your car into the parking spot, you got to back into the traffic, which is going by a, know, it's a crazy. pretty good click. And you're trying to get out of there and stuff. So it was a little tricky. You think, God, I get out of there. But uh, we found a parking space right over there. We set up camp right on the beach. And um, it was great. It was really great. Now, whenever we go snorkeling, I like the boys to stay in a partner. So it's like nobody goes snorkeling by themselves because you, if you start to drift away, you need somebody nearby. Well, you know, it's definitely, it was a lot more tumultuous up there. So we didn't let Mason do very much snorkeling because it was, he would just get whipped around a little bit too much. And he didn't want to put his um, mask on. So no, his fins on. Oh, his fins on. So we didn't let him go out beyond like waist deep because what we knew is if he had his fins on, he could at least kick against the waves a little bit if he was to get pulled a tiny bit, but he wouldn't. But Jacob and I went out snorkeling and uh, we stayed together and I asked him if he wanted to be my snorkeling buddy. And so he he did and we were floating over this reef area and following a school of fish that was just kind of darting around and it was super fascinating and then i noticed like we were drifting off to the side to where the only way we could get to the shore was through rocks and so i kept telling him like hey let's go back over here And I started to swim back towards the area where it was the sandy beach. And I'm watching him swimming closer in to look at things around the rock. And I'm thinking like, what is he doing right now? And I, you know, started to go back to the shore and I see him like up against the rocks and he looked totally fine to me. And I'm looking at him like watching, like, what is he doing? Like clinging to the rocks at the shore, not realizing that he'd hurt his foot and he couldn't swim over towards me. And the waves had started to pick up a bit and he couldn't break free from the rocks and was kind of getting smacked around a little bit right on the shore. Yeah. Another, uh, person that was there helped him get out of the water and I ran over to him to help him get to the sand. I think he, I think he banged up his knee or his shin or something he did. like that. His well, leg a little bit. Okay, but here's more to the story. You were on the shore FaceTiming people and I was out with all the kids trying to keep do, them. Hey, I do what I do best, baby. I know. And here I'm like trying to wave at you getting your attention because I was left with all three kids in the water and then you finally, we finally got your attention when Jacob was hurt and I couldn't get to him fast enough. And you came down there and you were like, what the heck happened? And it's like, well, that's what happens when one parent has to watch all three kids in the water. <laughs> well, and, and the being in the ocean. And I know that it's not as calm as a lagoon. It's a little more rough with water. It's like you right. said. So it was, it was the waves were crashing uh, on the beach and that sort of thing. And, and, and in Hawaii, a lot of the, the beaches, a lot of the water we go out there, there's the lava rocks they have there. And then, of course, there's the coral and things like that. It's not a smooth 
just empty nothing sandy beach right so. and he had he had cut the bottom of his foot which was making it harder for him to put his fin back on to get out of that area so you got him up to shore got him cleaned up and calmed down a little bit and then he came back in the water but what we started to notice is that the wind was picking up and that it was getting a little bit too rough for our level of comfort and so we decided to pack up the kids and to start driving um, back to where we were staying so that we could figure out dinner, um, only then to find out once we got back to our room that night that Tropical Storm Calvin was the culprit behind the wind picking up because it was just getting ready to hit Oahu. Um, no, I think it hit the main. I think it hit the Big Island first. It, but it it did. But it was getting ready to hit Oahu, so the wind had picked up just a little bit, and that was what that was a result of. Oh, interesting. I I do all of that research. That's why you're such a good uh, traveler, buddy. Thank you. So then the next day, we didn't have anything planned. We the kids were really wanting to go do this um, shark cage snorkeling adventure. I don't know if it was snorkeling or just you're in the shark cage, like watching the sharks get close to you or something like that but it's like a boat adventure you go on a boat they take you out maybe they throw chum in the water i don't know and you actually go into a shark cage you lower the shark cage in the water you're right there the sharks are right there it's like a you know it's like a one it's something you never get to do anywhere else you know, yeah they thing. don't throw the chum in there because are you would, sure yeah because that messes with the ecosystem and makes them associate humans as um like Meat. Well, you don't wear the chum on you. No. It's like, come on here, fishy, fishy, fishy. No, no, I read up about it. And so there's a lot of science behind why and where they go. But I was super paranoid about doing this. And the boys kept saying, come on, let's do it. And so, you know, I'd done the research, but then I was like, you know what, Chris, let's wait until tomorrow morning and I'll call and I'll see if there's anybody doing it. Well, tropical storm Calvin came in overnight and the waters were really rough. And so when we woke up the next morning and I looked out of our window, there wasn't a single boat out on the water. Not only that, it was very like misty and cl- and like lots of haze clouds. You couldn't see the sun. The sun right. was gone that day. It looked like a storm was coming, you know, and it, it did rain a little bit, not, not a ton, but it did rain a little bit where we were at. It did. And so we decided that we weren't going to be in the water on that day. Uh, but we found an alternative and that was that I had researched and I found an ATV place. Uh, um, it was called Coral Crater. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was these ATV adventures. It was like off-roading where because Zeke is 18, he was able to drive an ATV and you were able to drive an ATV and do this like off-roading, get all muddy stuff. So we drove out there and tell us what that adventure was like. Okay. So you say ATV, it's not your typical quad or motorcycle. What it is, it's like a side-by-side doom buggy, really what it is. If you think of like- With um, a roll cage, right? Yeah, of course. They all have roll cages. I think like the Rhino, is it called Rhinos, I think? I think the name of the brand. There's like a name brand of these things. Yeah, I have inside the uh, motorcycle shop all the time. But your typical gas powered, like doom buggy thing with a gas pedal, and there's a driver's seat and a passenger seat. And there uh, was, uh, I think, four cars in our group. The leader is in the lead car, and then had I think Jacob and, May- and Ezekiel were with a car in front of, front of behind them. And then behind them, I was with Mason. And then behind us was some two other people that we didn't mm-hmm. know. They were in their car and they give us this like head face, like um, it's like a head wrap, almost like a, because you do get very dirty and dusty and goggles, of course, because you want to get dirt and dust in your eyes. And they take you on this trail and you just follow the leader. So the leader is the the guide and they take us on all these different trails that kind of go down through these bushes, these trees around this junkyard thing, up this hill, down this hill. It was almost as if somebody made a big, awesome, like dirt track in their backyard and we were just cruising around, following them. They had these berms. You go up this berm and these other parts. And they're basically just taking us around for like the hour or half hour, however long the actual time was. And at one point, we stopped under this big giant like, I guess it was like an obstacle course made out of wood. Almost like a, think of it like an adult version of a jungle gym. Okay. Made out of like wood and stuff like the military would use to like do okay. climbing and stuff like that. And they had like, it's kind of where their zip line, I think, ended or one of the zip line sections ended. And we stopped there. We got a break, looked around, walked around. 
And we didn't climb nothing, but but we, at that point, we were able to switch drivers if we wanted to or switch passengers. And I told Mason and, J- Mason and Jacob, let's switch. Let's switch out because you guys are, you know, it'd be fun. Now it's time to do it. No, I don't want to switch. Well, no, Jacob didn't want to switch with Ezekiel. He wanted to stay where he was with right. Ezekiel. And I was like, come on. And Mason's like, come on, let's switch. Let's switch. So let's switch. It'd be fun. Nope. They didn't want to do it. So like, whatever. We get back in. We start following the trail again. And the guy took us on all kinds of different trails. And what's funny is that I had two GoPros I brought with me on that trip. And I give one to Jacob to, to use with Ezekiel. And one Mason was using to use with me in Bride and Adventure. The moment we turn the cars on, the moment we turn the, the cameras on, my stupidity, somehow I must have mixed up the batteries and I brought dead batteries with me in those cameras. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so they did not get any footage at I'm all. I'm very that day. upset about that. It I was knew. like the most expensive splurge that I paid for out of my own pocket. And then I literally can't even live vicariously through <laughs> you both. Because I have a bad back and there, oh, was, you would have no hated way, oh. there was no way I was going to risk the rest of our trip being miserable or injured. Uh, but I wanted to see the adventures. And so, you know, honestly, tell us the truth. Were you guys like nice to each other and just like follow the line leader? Or was there some like attempting to like, like cut it so that you're spinning dirt on somebody else. Might have been a little bit of that, I think. But see, Zeke was in front of me driving. So whatever he did is what he did. I got the the dirt. I guess if he cut any dirt and kicked that <laughs> dirt, I, we would have got it on us. Okay. So that's kind of the way it was. And I'm kind of looking behind me to make sure the guy behind me was following the, the trail, didn't get lost or anything like that too. And they even walk us through what happens if you need to put the car in reverse, if you go off the trail or something like that. Or what happens if you roll? Well, that they told us that too. If it rolls, to make sure you, you uh, of course, we're all wearing seatbelts, you know, mm-hmm. is it kind of like, don't put your hands out. That's one thing they always tell you because you always have this habit to like, if you're tipping over, like put your hand out to kind of stop you from tipping kind of thing. And that will rip, break your arm right off because mm-hmm. you're going over. But but to kind of get inside, tuck inside and kind of like hang on until it stops. Tuck and roll. Yeah, basically until it stops rolling, that kind of thing. But uh, luckily, no one, nobody did that. I almost did it one time though. I just came off this berm. And I was following Ezekiel and he was going and I went a little crazier. I was like, because I got a little more confidence. This is like halfway through the trip. So I'm getting a little okay. confidence driving this thing. And I take it through the berm and I come out of the berm and I kind of hit it on two wheels. And I noticed it kind of like almost kind of twitched, twitched a little bit when I came, when it came down because, because I guess it didn't come down flat and smooth, you know? And I was like, I was like almost on three wheels, I guess at one point and I and it landed down. I kind of twisted the wheel and it landed down, but it's like, oh my gosh, that kind of gave me a little flutter in my heart when I noticed it was almost <laughs> be me, the one that rolls the car on this little adventure, you know? Well, rumor is that Jacob and Ezekiel put your doom buggy to shame. I heard that they... Oh, did they now? Yes, I heard they spun some dirt on you and they totally whooped you on that trail. Uh, well, you know what? I, you know what? I had a... They were in my way the entire time. Uh, I, couldn't get, sure. I, couldn't, I couldn't get past them. These sure. trails... These trails were single lane only, so I couldn't pass them. So, you know, it's kind of okay. Weird. There was one part where they did take us on the one area. It was really flat and nice straightaway where you could open up the full throttle. There was a speedometer on there. And I asked the lady, it doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> it's always showing the same speed or whatever. It's broken. But I'm like, oh, man. But I think she said these things get to like 40 miles an hour. Well, that sounds like you guys had a blast. And then that night we ended up, I think we went to, did we go to the Teppanyaki restaurant Th- that, that night? That is correct. We did that night. It's like a Benihana, like any kind of like, what is it called? Teppanyaki. Uh, yep. Where they grill the food right in front of you. They do the onion thing. They do the, the fried rice thing. And they do the uh, choo-choo train. And the, I think they did an actual volcano and they put the... Yeah. Um, and it actually went to the big fire and, and it was yeah. like, it was like, whoa, check totally that out. Totally blew us away. It was literally. But that was our fun splurge for the trip where we celebrated Ezekiel's graduation. They brought out a special little uh, celebratory dessert for him and we sang to him. And it was really fun because this was part of that, you know, family celebration of Ezekiel's graduation. And, uh, it was just a really fun day. And then the next day we had our Pearl Harbor day. So we had pre-made reservations uh, for a private tour of Pearl Harbor. Now it's not private when you get out to the USS Arizona, but whenever you're figuring out how to get out to Pearl Harbor, you know, if you don't want to drive out there and navigate parking on your own and try and get in the lines and try and get tickets, 
then it's recommended that you go through a company that's based in Hawaii to help you with that. And so uh, my travel hack, and I would encourage you to use this with whatever, wherever you're going. I use this company for planning my excursions when I'm going on cruises and everything because they have a great cancellation policy and it's called Viator, V-I-A-T-O-R.com. It's a division of TripAdvisor. I've used them for multiple trips and this is not sponsored, but it should be. Uh, But I always get the best deals when I go on to Viator and I've had really great experiences with tour guides. I've only had one bad experience and that was in Paris, but I ran late and so I missed my tour. But otherwise, every other one I've used has been exceptional. And so I ended up booking us private transport. So we had like private SUV transport and um, we ended up uh, going on that private transport. Our driver took us out to the Pearl Harbor Memorial. He gave us a little orientation to where everything was. He already had our tickets for us that had like pre-slugged timing on it. And we were able to walk through the two museums on site, get right into line and go out to the memorial, even though it was a short time we got to have out at the memorial. Yeah, it was really short. For some reason, I feel like we got there, went to the side, looked around, went to the other side, looked around, went to the back, saw the names that's in the back uh, etched on the wall. And then before we know it, we got to load the boat. I'm like, wait a second. I thought we just got here. Right. So what happened is when we were getting ready to go out to the memorial, we were in the little staging theater. And then they told us that they had a slight 15 minute delay and they were going to combine our tour with the one after us, which was the, the last tour before they took their lunch break. So by the time we got out there, uh, it was like, 10 minutes that we had maybe, maybe 12 minutes. So, you know, we didn't get a lot of time, but for our boys and their attention span, it was long enough. I think it was great. And if you don't know, the USS Arizona was one of the ships that actually sunk right there at Pearl Harbor during the attack of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 and by the Japanese. And it actually sits right there in the harbor on the floor of the harbor, which is about 45 feet deep, which is really shallow, which is why the Navy at the time thought, oh, no, nobody's coming to get us. That submarines <laughs> right. can't, nobody's getting us because we're so shallow and pr- protected here. But anyways, um, yeah, it sank and the memorial sits right on top of the actual sunken ship. The memorial, Without touching it. That's that, what they say. It's, yeah. it's on top but does not touch. Right. So it's actually the memorial platform. It's actually sitting right on the, on the, on the ground of the Harbor. It's only 45 feet deep. And then the, um, the, it sits right above the actual ship, which actually still entombs all the soldiers and Navy that were trapped inside there. They're right. still inside there today. Well, what's left of them? Not probably not much, but they were never rescued out of there. Right. And so it was quite the experience for our boys to be able to go out there. And then once we came back, we had just enough time to loop around and go into the theater next door where we were able to let them see the 20 minute documentary uh, with real footage of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so it was a really good day to be able to give them perspective. And then our tour driver came back and picked us up and then he took us to see um, the national cemetery and drove us by a few other landmarks before taking us back to the hotel so that we could um, end our day doing one of the things that we had promised Jacob, which is renting water bikes and going in the, there's two different lagoon areas. So there was the like little lagoon opened up into the ocean area, but then there's more like a bay. Is it a bay? No, is it more like a, it's a, I call it a lagoon. I think it's, a lagoon is something that's separated from the water. Isn't no, it? No, that was like a little lagoon. It was just like a little alcove. But the other one is a man-made lagoon on the resort property with a little island that they've built. And they rent out water bikes and stand-up paddle boards and other types of things and umbrellas and chairs and stuff like that. And I had promised Jacob since before we even went on the trip that I would rent him a water bike because he saw that on a video and he was like, I want to do that. So 
Uh, or maybe he saw the ones that people were actually using when we were over there by the beach. He's like, oh, I got to have that too. Right. So the water bike, really what it is, it's a giant three-wheeler with these big, giant, massive, like balloon-sized tires. And the two back tires have like notches in them for like paddles. So when you do pedal the thing, you're turning those back tires like you would a big wheel, three-wheeler. Mm-hmm. And or like pa- a paddle boat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it paddles the, but they're not that easy to paddle. <laughs> no, or the, steer. Or steer because they don't really, the rudder's in the front like a tire. So you don't really, it's it's different than you would think, but it's more for like just cruising and just playing around on those things. And the kids had a blast. Everybody had a blast on those things. We did. And what's hilarious is we rented one water bike and one stand up paddle board and the boys were just going to share everything. Well, I don't know how it happened, but Mason Sweet talked himself into getting us two water bikes uh, for the cost of one. What a, 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 a <laughs> character. How do you do that? And then Zeke got a stand up paddle board. And so then, of course, the boys had been on their best behavior for the whole day because we were out at Pearl Harbor and they, you know, we talked with them about etiquette. And uh, because basically it's funeral etiquette when you're out there because it's, it's a grave site. And so they'd been holding in all of their energy and we got out to this lagoon and they let their crazy out. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, they definitely did. Yeah. Um, they were like, well, the water, first off, it's very calm. There's no waves really at all. It's like being in one big giant swimming pool. The depth of the water is maybe five feet deep, all the way in the deepest spot. And you have this island you can go around and the water is fairly clear. And of course, you know, there, there's some small fish I noticed that were in there. There were. And the kids were jumping off different things and playing around and playing their water things. I think I remember they used to do the same crazy, goofy things in their friend's pool who has got a pool and a kayak. Right. And they would play in that thing and do dangerous stuff in there. But they were kind of doing the same kind of things. I, kind of, I get the idea when I saw them playing around was that, oh, yeah, this is like they were doing it at their pool, their friend's house. But this is like on a grander scale, much bigger pool, which much cooler toys to play around with. Yeah. And, you know, they were getting wild and crazy and like driving us nuts. And here we are like yelling at them from the shore, like to knock it off. And then at one point, I think you and I just finally were like, forget it all. And we just got off of our chairs and we jumped out into the water and we hijacked one of the water bikes. And then we just started playing with the kids and, you know, just like trying to go after them on the water bikes and play with them a little bit to have a little bit of fun. And then, you know, they were playing like King of the Mountain and I would try and like get underneath Zeke's paddleboard and try and like flip it over. But dude is strong. Who is? Zeke is. I couldn't flip him. I could not. He was like sturdy and he's like, you know, I'd go up underneath and I'd try and like push that stand up paddleboard. But it, first of all, this, the board was not light. Second of all, Zeke's built like he's got strong legs and a strong core and i couldn't tilt him oh, well we all had fun that's the moral of the story right yeah. it was our very last day a very last evening afternoon at the beach in hawaii and what better way than just hang out there on the beach have a blast in the water the very last time being in the water because the very next day we had to figure out a way to get everybody packed, get the rooms clean, which is another disaster. But, don't, don't. but there was still something else we did that night. What could we possibly do that My night? My friend Jade. Who, That's right. How did I forget that? Who used to live in San Diego, but she um, and her wife had to relocate to Hawaii because of the military. And she lives on the island of Oahu. I'd reached out to her ahead of time and we invited her over to come and have dinner with us. And at that dinner... What we were trying to do is like cook up everything else that was remaining in oh, the cupboard. Oh yeah, because we can't bring it with us. We can't, right. we can't leave it there, and we can't we can't bring it with us. So anything we had bought at the store via the Instacart, thank you, Christine. We were able to just grill it all up, cook it all up, or talk. What did we have? We had the and rotisserie and chicken, and-, and then I made spaghetti, and then we had breadsticks. But then we weren't sure it was going to be enough food, so then we ordered pizza. From the oh, pizza place that was on site, that's the round right. table. It, I th- yeah, it was, it was round table, which is normally pretty expensive as it is. And then, of course, being Hawaii, being at the resort, you can only imagine the prices for a small pizza we ordered. And, of course, I can't get a regular pizza. So I ordered the Maui Zowie pizza. Which I found for you. And it was really, really good. So it was uh, Canadian bacon, pineapple, 
green bell pepper and red onion. And it was so good. And I don't know if they use barbecue sauce. Yeah, or it sauce. had like a barbecue sauce drizzle on it. It was really good. Yeah, it was, a, it was like a twist on the Hawaiian pizza, really. And is, the barbecue chicken pizza, like a combination. Kinda, I always kind of wonder if you went to Hawaii and ordered Hawaiian pizza, does it, do they have it on the menu as like us pizza? <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Well, so we did that that night and then we took the kids down to the eighth floor infinity pool, which they hadn't been to yet. And Jade and I hung out in the pool with the, a couple of the kids. And of course, they were being wild. Um, but, you know, it was vacation. And well, last night of vacation. really. Yeah, so. absolutely. And so then after that, we put the kids to bed. And then you and I and Jade, we went downstairs um, to the lobby of the tower and there was a little like live music bar area. And we ended up getting a farewell cocktail before we ended the evening. I got a I got a strawberry daiquiri and I know you got a pina colada and and Jade got something delicious, too. Right. I think I got to go fruity, you know, for the most part, like, you know what? I may, you know, call me, call me whatever, but I, I think I like, I'm starting to like the fruity drinks now, right. you know, like, I mean, they're fun. I mean, getting a beer and get the beer anywhere, but beers give me headaches. They used to, I used to get not, not you know, do very well with beer. So I, I'm okay with like a margarita or a pina colada or anything like that. I am fine. and eh? Okay. Yeah. So we, we wrapped our night up that way and, you know, said our goodbyes to Jade and then went upstairs. And of course, we had to do all of our packing that night and the next day. Fortunately, we didn't have to leave at the crack of dawn. I mean, we had to leave reasonably early, but our flight wasn't super, super early. We had to leave at like 8.15 for the terminal, but we were able to get everything packed up and the boys did a great job of getting themselves situated. And we had a pretty uneventful flight back and got food at the airport. And I told everybody like we could go sit at this uh, restaurant and eat. And then I told you, I was like, hey, go check and see if they're boarding. And you were like, they're on last call. Yeah, so where we had are to you? Like, run over and get on our flight. Yeah, but it was like right next door. So at least we had everybody flying home on a full stomach. The kids slept most of the way. And we got home and it was just an epic and wonderful vacation. I loved every minute. I love going to Hawaii. Like literally, I took, I told you this once, I'll say it again, is that of all the places to vacation for, for the rest of my life, I said, you only one place to vacation at, it'd be Hawaii, I'd be set. Yeah, it is really beautiful. And you know, one of the things that I'm always intrigued by is the history of the land of Hawaii. And so... We made sure to weave that in as we were talking with our boys about, you know, making sure that we're respectful to the land, that we're cleaning up after ourselves and leaving no trace. And, you know, it's the Hawaii is so, it, I wouldn't say industrialized, but there's so much tourism there that I think that we forget just how sacred the land is to the native Hawaiian people. And how if we are going to visit, trying to not do damage or exploit the land in any way. But um, we did go and visit a couple of beaches. We went when we were on the North Shore and we took the kids to go see the beach where this, the opening scenes and most of the show Lost was filmed. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we went over there. That's where the yeah. kids found, found a log laying next to the water and a coconut of all things. And they were trying to... <laughs> open the coconut up like they're on a, on a deserted island and like try to break it open, not like eat it, but just like the experience of like finding a coconut on a beach on a, right. on a tropical island and cutting it open and like, you know, seeing what's inside and whatever and all that stuff. So they had pictures of them doing that goofy stuff. And uh, that's a really good shots of them over there. And I think about it with my phone because uh, the lighting looked great and the water looked great and the backdrop looked great. And um, it was, it was great. Yeah. Our last day when we were there, right after we left the lagoon, I told you I wanted an authentic Hawaiian shave ice. And they had the truck that was there that sits right near uh, the lagoon and it's on the resort property. And so we walked over there and we got our, sh I, my shave ice. And then the kids had their um, smoothies in their pineapple, which, you know, they had been wanting. And we got those, I think one other time during the trip, but as we're, we're standing on the side of the beach 
and we're just enjoying our refreshments. We're just like looking out at that same kind of lagoon-ish area where the kids had snorkeled a few days prior. And what do we see? But sea turtles just popping their heads up, getting some air and just kind of flitting around and playing in the water there. And it's just a reminder of just how magnificent the Hawaiian islands are and really how magical they are. Yeah, There's that, nothing like it. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember that ever since I was a small child, and my parents went on their first trip to Hawaii and was talking about the all the cool stuff. They brought back souvenirs of shell necklaces and all that stuff. And of course, you know, the pictures my dad took of snorkeling in the water. And this is all they had like the underwater instant cameras and things like right. that. And how, how they explain that you just lay in the water there and you can snorkel and you can see all cool stuff. And I'm like, that it sounds amazing. And I've always wanted to go and, um, you know, and do that kind of stuff. And, and it's been great. And like I said, you know, I love Hawaii. And from here in San Diego, it's not that far to get to where it could be the other side of the world for some people, you know. Um, I think it's great. And I want to propose to you, honey, that we buy a vacation home in Hawaii. <laughs> You know, um, of course, after all the dust settles from everything's happening right now, but I'm saying that maybe we should buy like, you know, a three bedroom house somewhere on the beach over there. What do you say? <laughs> well, you know, there were some really cute places over there that I wouldn't mind. I mean, it is definitely beautiful. Uh, we'll see where the future takes us. But, you know, for now, it was a really wonderful way to spend family time together. I would have been totally happy with a second week there. I think that if you give our kids like two more years, that the trip would be even more relaxing for us because I feel like Mason is still on the young end and requires us to supervise him quite a bit when we're there to make sure like when he's near the water that he's safe, even though, you know, he is kind of getting older. But I feel like if he was to get like if the kids were like 13, 15, 19, 20, I think that's a good span. Maybe in two more years, we could think about going back with them. And getting like a house maybe? Like to forever? Yeah. I'm not like move there, but like have like a, like a vacation house. Oh, like an Airbnb? Well, yeah, we'd have one. We oh, rent- you want us to buy something in two years? Uh, or or this year, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> I, I was thinking about physically buying a property in Hawaii that we could go vacation at. Well, thank you for putting that on the airwaves and just like putting me on blast right now. I will make no commitments to anything other than it would be nice to be able to take another trip back to Hawaii sometime in the future. That's what I'm saying. Like of all the places in the United States that you could visit, visit back any time of year and not, and enjoy it, you know, pretty much. And that's fairly close to get to. Hawaii hits all those checklists. Yep, I hear that. However, what I liked about this Hawaii trip is that every day when we left, somebody came in and cleaned everything for me. Or maybe you buy a, like a condo or something. I don't know how that stuff works. Come on no, now. If you're talking timeshare now, do not come at us. <laughs> this is not your invitation, timeshare people. No, uh, yes, I'm anti timeshare. I know you are too, but I'm saying like if I ever were to buy a timeshare, that'd be the place to do it. I think. definitely. I wouldn't buy it in Vegas. It could be stupid if I went to Vegas. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not timeshare. Because once you get in, you can't get out. But I'm saying like physically, if you actually had had the cash, you could buy a piece of property, whether it's a condo or a house in Hawaii that you could rent out when you're not using it. Okay, if you all can't see me right now, I'm rolling my eyes at him because this is what he does when he tries to get me to agree to something is to try and get it committed to the airwaves so that he could go back and replay it and say, see, you agreed to this. I agree to nothing other than I agree on the fact that it was an an amazing vacation. It was. It was. And I love to have variety in where I travel. And my number one thing that I like about traveling is housekeeping that comes in and cleans up after me. Well, you married me, baby doll. (laughs) I'm your housekeeper. Okay. Biggest lie ever. Uh, Who plays around here? Come on now. No, you don't. But anyways... So again, as we shared at the very beginning of this episode, uh, we share all of our adventures in Hawaii not to lighten anything that's currently happening on the island of Maui and that the Hawaiian people are going through, but to highlight the importance of preserving such a beautiful landscape as is the Hawaiian islands so that it can be enjoyed by both the indigenous Hawaiian families and 
tourists for years to come, but the focus being on regenerating the beauty. And so uh, again, definitely please check out our show notes from today's episode so you can find out reputable places to donate. Tag us on social media whenever you make that donation so we can shout you out. And let's really rally together and uh, support the recovery efforts for Hawaii and specifically the island of Maui. Um, And our hearts definitely go out to the people that are so deeply grieving there. That's right. Good job. And so thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in for our annual family vacation recap. And we'll be back with you next Next week. week.